Recently, um, recently I went down a rabbit hole. Um, I was I was listening to a podcast that was put out by the Banner of Truth. Um, it was all about the pastor and his study, and they were quoting several um, dead theologians. And so I did some looking through some of the people that they were quoting, and I found it very helpful to read through some of the works of faithful ministers of the past, um, including this by a man by the name of J.W. Alexander. He was an American minister and a theologian in the 1800s. This is a snippet from his, uh, his work, Letters to Young Ministers. He said this, We are persuaded that grave errors prevail in respect to what should be the aim of the pastor in his parochial studies and discipline. Looking at the greatness of the harvest and the shortness of life, one is tempted at first blush to say, let the study alone, go forth and save souls. When learning in the ministry is mentioned, some are ready to think of it as purely a secular erudition, such as withdraws a man from his duty or unfits him for it. I beg you to observe that the ministerial learning which I am recommending is solely the discipline and accomplishment whereby you shall be better fitted for your work. The study, he says, is not a place for lettered luxury, but the sacred combat arena in which Christ's soldier is supposed to be forging his armor, hardening his muscle, and training his agility for the actual combat of the ministry. If in the daily pursuit of knowledge you keep constantly before your mind the end for which you seek it, there need be no fear of excess. To the last day of life, regard your mental powers as given you to be kept in continual working order and continual improvement, and this with reference to the work of preaching and teaching. You will find all great preachers have lived thus. I earnestly charge you to hold all studies only as a means to this end, the glory of God in the salvation of souls. That same podcast, Banner of Truth, they went on to quote a man by the name of David A. Sherwood, and he had written an article in the 90s comparing the work of a pastor um, to that of a trial attorney. And he wrote this. He said, none of the above is intended to deny that the pastor-teacher should in fact be a people person. This is true not only in the manner in which he communicates the word of God, but also of his work as an elder and as a shepherd, i.e. those responsibilities which he shares with the other elders. Indeed, we would go so far as to say that the pastor-teacher who does not cultivate good relationships with people will not be very effective in any of the work he does. But these things understood... It needs to be clearly seen that the reason why the pastor-teacher is in the church's employ is so that he may proclaim the Word of God. While this is most conspicuously a matter of practice, i.e. actually doing it, it's also most definitely a matter of preparation. Our contention is that if the pastor-teacher is to do his job well, the major part of his time should should be spent in preparation. However, that is to be defined in any particular case. It is a great temptation for the pastor-teacher to immerse himself in a whole host of administrative and social activities. In so doing, he may even become regarded as omnicompetent and as having a, a great way with people. He'll certainly avoid the accusation of being bookish or the like. But sadly, he will in all likelihood fail to feed the flock, fail to demonstrate himself to be a well-approved workman who has no need to be ashamed, and so fail to excel in the one thing that he is uniquely called and qualified to do. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 11 to 22, and you'll see why I'm starting there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm going to, we're actually going to look at 12 to 22, I'm going to start reading in verse 11. Therefore, Paul writes, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you 
and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Let's stop and pray. Father, this is quite a list of things to do. I pray that you would help us to understand. I pray that your word, uh, your spirit would work as we read, as we preach your word today, Lord, as we hear. That your spirit would be working to transform our hearts and our minds. I pray that I would decrease and that Christ would increase. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we come to the close of this letter, uh, we've been working, I I think all year, maybe we started in December on 1 Thessalonians Um, As we come now to the close, Paul lays out several imperatives, um, several commands that he wants to encourage the church with. In fact, depending on how you count them, uh, there's something like 17 distinct imperatives between verses 12 and 22. And and honestly, um, I was telling somebody on the way in this morning, each one of them could be a sermon. Maybe we'll do that someday, but not today. These are not the commands, however, of, a, of an autocratic dictator. He isn't just simply calling his subjects to obey because I said so, or even because this is how good Christians act. Rather, he is calling the church to do these things because as he explicitly says in verse 18, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then beyond that, in in chapter 3, verse 13, he had prayed that the Lord would establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. And this is getting at that. Then similar to that, look down in chapter 5, verse 23, near the end. It's the next verse that I haven't read yet. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That verse is very similar to chapter 3, verse 13, which was his prayer. So if we put these things together, obedience to God's commands leads to sanctification. Obedience to Christ's commands leads to the holiness without which no one will see the Lord, as Hebrews 12 says. We have to keep in mind that the purpose of the church, think about these things, why does the church gather? What is the purpose of the church? I'll give you a hint, it's not evangelism. The purpose of the church is to glorify God. We do that through evangelism is one of the ways. Remember, the Great Commission doesn't stop at baptizing them. It actually moves from that to teaching them to observe all that I have commanded them. This is why I included verse 11 uh, when I read this passage. Because obedience to the Lord, in these verses in particular, obedience to the Lord will encourage and build one another up in the Lord. Now keep in mind, Uh, I'm going to contend that these are imperatives, these are commands, not just for individual Christians, but actually for the entire covenant community, for the entire church. And if we as a church actually follow these commands, we will be well on our way toward holiness and blamelessness when our Savior returns. Now, sometimes with these kind of rapid-fire commands. Um, Some of them are just a couple of words. A whole verse is just a couple of words. Pray without ceasing. Sometimes with these kind of rapid-fire commands, it it almost looks like there's no rhyme or reason uh, to them. 
It's as if Paul is just kind of haphazardly throwing them out there, not in any kind of logical order. Oh yeah, do this, and do this, and while you're at it, do this. But throughout this letter, the apostle has actually been addressing specific topics that the Thessalonian church actually needed help with. And as he continues doing that here, he actually is laying out a very basic framework for the structure of the ministry. So as we consider the the church imperative, or maybe a way to say that would be the church obedient, I want to give you my outline at the beginning, and then we're going to go back through each of these um, individually. So the first thing that we see is the relationship between the church and her elders. The church and her elders, that's verses 12 and 13. Then when we get into verses 15, 14 and 15, we see the church and her members, a relationship to one another. Then in verses 16 to 18 is the church and her attitudes. The church and her attitudes. So the church and her elders, the church and her members, the church and her attitudes. And then finally in verses 19 to 22, you can see the church, I'm just going to say the church and her anchor. The church and her anchor. So as I said, in verse 11... We saw that the church is to encourage one another. In fact, it says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you're doing. Encourage one another. That first phrase really points back at what Paul had been writing throughout all of, really, throughout all of chapters 4 and 5. All of those things are given to encourage one another. Encourage each other through, through living pure lives, he says. Encourage each other through your brotherly love for one another. Encourage each other through your holiness before God and Father as we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the saints. But also we see there in verse 11, not only is the church to encourage each other, but also to build one another up. And that phrase really points forward as to these general exhortations, these imperatives that we're looking at today. There are many ways that the building up of the church can happen. Uh, particularly when we're talking about uh, kind of within the structure of the church. This really begins with the elders. I'll explain why. So the church and her elders, verses 12 and 13. We ask your brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. I'm going to just say right here, is a really awkward thing to preach. <laughs> this is one where you want to ask somebody else to come in and preach. But that's, this is my job, so here we go. A simple job description for church elders, a very simple job description, a very basic job description for church elders is found in Acts chapter 6, verse 4. We will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Prayer and ministry of the Word. Obviously, that is not the extent of the work of elders. Uh, In fact, Peter, one of the ones who said that in Acts 6, 4, Peter will later write in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Peter, of course, had learned this directly from Jesus himself. Jesus had instructed Peter right at the end of the Gospel of John, after his uh, resurrection, before his ascension, when he was reestablishing Peter and forgiving him and, and, and bringing him back to the ministry, he says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. There are many who have sometimes summarized that as the role of a pastor, the role of the elders is to lead, feed, and protect That's the job of the elders, to lead, feed, and protect. It should be noted in this passage here that that Paul doesn't even use any job titles. Um, 
He doesn't actually call them elders or pastors or deacons or anything like that here. He just kind of uses some, I guess, job descriptions, as it were. Might be because New Testament offices of elder and deacon haven't, haven't yet been fully developed. Remember, this is one of the first letters written. So the, the church at Thessalonica didn't have, uh, uh, for example, they did not have the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles. They didn't have that yet. They didn't have the books of Colossians and, and Ephesians, which, which talk so much about this, or 2 Corinthians, such a pastoral letter. They have this. In fact, um, it's probably true that they didn't have written down copies of the Gospels yet. So the good news, the, the news about Jesus Christ is, is spreading word of mouth. The church is still in its infancy. But that doesn't mean that she doesn't have elders or even deacons. Acts 14.23, which was, takes place before he had been in Thessalonica, Acts 14.23 tells us that when Paul and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey, it says this, and when they had appointed elders for them, that is these churches, in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed to them the Lord in whom they had believed. So regardless of the fact that Paul did not use the word elders here, he names, he names three characteristics of church elders, and he says that those who are called to this ministry are to be shown proper respect. The first characteristic is this, they labor among you. This is the first thing that he says about them. They labor among you. Now, labor is a little bit different than just work, Right? Labor's a little bit more intensive. A person can get up and go to work every day, but there are days when you labor at a certain task. Days when the work is laboring, laborous. Labor here is the same idea that he had used, uh, speaking of himself back in chapter 2, verse 9, when he, when he wrote, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So whatever this labor is here, it is a demanding work. Paul goes on in, in other places to expand on this a little bit in, in writings that would come a little bit later. So in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, he, he actually draws a connection from the Old Testament and he connects, he connects um, the labor of preaching and teaching with agricultural work. He says this, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. The idea of this kind of laboring is that it is a costly effort, even to the point of exhaustion. So Matthew Henry, the great uh, commentary writer, he will say this, they're called laborers and should not be loiterers. John Stott. John Stott will say this. He says, whether it is uh, study and the preparation of sermons or visiting the sick and counseling the disturbed or instructing people for baptism and marriage or being diligent in intercession, these things demand we toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within us. Now, I readily admit that much of a pastor's work is, um, very little of it is physically demanding. But as one writer said, the spiritual demands and emotional anxieties involved in the work can even sap the strength of someone with a robust constitution. <laughs> All of this tells us that churches should expect, I'm telling you, what you should expect of me, of Ben, of your elders. Churches should expect their pastors to work hard especially in the preparation of sermons, which week in and week out demand the most labor of those engaged in the work. There's an analogy that one person said, I, I don't know if you'll find this humorous, but as somebody who gets up every Monday morning and has another sermon to prepare, it's like you spend all week pushing a boulder up the hill 
and then you wake up Monday morning and it's at the bottom of the hill again, and you got to start over. I want to point out that this is, this is not a verse that tells pastors or elders to work hard. It's actually just simply understood that they do. It's a verse that instructs the church how to treat those who do, those who do work hard. And so we can say that the first characteristic of an elder who is worthy of respect is that he labors, he works hard for the good of the church. Secondly, Paul calls the Thessalonians to respect those who are over you in the Lord. Now, this, this phrase, over you in the Lord, can actually be translated in a couple of different ways. And the meaning is actually, I think it's actually a combination of the two. Um, I think there's a double meaning here. So it means exercise leadership, authority, or even to rule. That's what it means. But it also can mean to show concern and care for. And I think the best place to see the connection of those two things is, um, is in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where both elders and deacons are called to manage that's the same word, manage their own households well. That same word manage there is the word rule. They are to rule their own households well in a godly, loving, and dignified way. So this is exactly the same, uh, what he is saying here uh, about how they are to lead the church in a godly, loving, and dignified way, how they lead their homes. Let the elders who, he, again, I read this in 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well, manage well, lovingly lead well, be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. This is why another, um, another title given to the office of elder is overseer. Old translations, King James translated it bishop, but it's this word overseer, episkopos is the Greek word where we get the word episcopal from. They are to oversee, they are to exercise leadership and authority in a loving and godly way. They are to rule as fathers lead in their homes, and this is to be done in the Lord. See, elders, elders are under shepherds who lead the church as representatives of the Good Shepherd, under the authority of the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, carrying out their tasks and their duties according to His will. One of the most fearsome verses for any elder ought to be, if it's not, Hebrews 13, 17, which says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. As those who will have to give an account. Not an account to you, but maybe at some point. An account to God. That is a fearsome verse. And then the third characteristic of an elder who is worthy of respect is that he does the work of admonishing. It's an interesting term. It's actually distinct to the Apostle Paul. It literally means to put something in someone's mind. To put something in someone's mind. So it can mean simply along the lines of instruct, teaching, but it also carries an air about it of warning. Um, in this case, it's not used in any kind of negative way, but rather as a, as, a, as a teaching and instructing them to run from sin and run to Christ. So pastors and elders are tasked with admonishing the church from the Word of God to aim towards Christ-likeness and holiness. Sometimes this will be in the form of a warning, but always this is to be done, as we learn from 1 Timothy, with complete patience and teaching. So in light of these three tasks of the elders, and knowing that the elders are to be godly, qualified men under the authority of Jesus Christ, Paul calls on the church to respect them and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. 
Richard Phillips, one of the authors I was reading, says, a faithful pastor labors intensely for the spiritual well-being of his flock. One of the chief blessings that compensates for the many trials is the loving appreciation and affection of the people. I couldn't think of a better church to serve than RBC. And I mean that sincerely. I couldn't think of a better church to serve than you. Well, when we realize that the elders keep watch over the souls of those under their care and that they will give an account to the Lord for their ministry, it's actually easier to respect them. It's easier to respect them uh, highly, to esteem them highly in love. And all of this leads to peace within the church. That's the last line there of verse 13, be at peace among yourselves. It's included with this idea. It leads to the next one, but it's included with this idea. Specifically, this is about the, uh, the congregation and her elders. Peace within the church, but it also is leading here to the church and her members, verses 14 and 15. Let me read these verses. So the end of verse 13 says, Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See to it, uh, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Brothers, brothers, he says, urge you, brothers. Brothers for Paul, all through this letter is shorthand for fellow church members. And so we can see this shift kind of pretty easily here. He's now shifting his focus from the leadership back onto the church as a whole. Most notably, he is calling the entire church to minister to some of their, of their fellow church members who seem to be troubled in various ways, as he says. I just want to point out, this is exactly what is supposed to happen. This is exactly what is supposed to happen. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, let me read this passage. It's verses 11 to 16. As Christ, Paul is saying that as Christ ascended, he gave gifts to the church. He quotes in verse 8 and says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. And here are some of the gifts. Verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love listen again we urge you brothers admonish the idle encourage the faint-hearted help the weak be patient with them all see that no one repays evil for evil but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone so that it builds itself up in love this is another way for the church to be at peace by working to build itself up in love. Right off the bat here, there's actually an interpretive challenge in verse 14. See, that word, the idle, it can also mean the undisciplined, but it also can mean the disruptive. There are folks who are out of step, he's saying, with the teaching of the church. This could mean that they're out of step with Paul and not following his example of hard work, as I just read a few minutes ago from chapter 2. It could also mean that they hear the teaching, they hear the preaching, yet they're too lazy to apply it. Maybe they don't get up and go to church at all. It could also mean that they just sit, they just sit comfortably in their pew and, and never serve in any way. Regardless, the church is called here to admonish them. It's that same word. And here, that very much means that the church is to warn them from the Scriptures. This is a call for the church to warn one another, to warn the idol. I believe that one of the best ways to overcome this kind of 
undisciplined life is to set aside Sunday as the Lord's day. That phrase is actually from the New Testament, the Lord's day. I think it's to set aside the Lord's day. See, the person who doesn't plan to attend the worship of the Lord on his day, as he prescribes in Scripture, is the person who also typically doesn't spend time reading the Word, doesn't spend any time praying. All too often, it's the person who stays out too late on Saturday night, and when Sunday morning rolls around, they're too tired to get up and worship. Admonish the idol. To admonish the idol is uh, to say, if you don't make it a priority to assemble with the saints every week, then you will almost certainly eventually stop attending altogether, which is potentially evidence that you were never a believer to begin with, because believers assemble. That's what we do. We're called the assembly of the saints. Let's continue. Peace in the church is promoted when encouragement of the discouraged or the faint-hearted and the helping of the weak is a priority of the church. Those two things are related. One is uh, likely spiritual, one is physical, but this is carefully meeting one another's needs and doing so patiently. Carefully meeting one another's needs with patience. Look again at verse 15. He moves on and says, See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. We can see how this enhances the the harmony and the peace of the church. We're called to be slow to anger, quick to forgive. This is especially true with one another in the church. And when church members get together, whether whether it's here on the Lord's Day whether it is in our homes during the week or some other time, when we gather, our meetings should not be gripe sessions. Instead, we're, we're called to, as Colossians 3 says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one is a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Be thankful. This leads us to examine the church and her attitudes. The church and her attitudes, verses 16, 17, and 18. Think of these as attitudes. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How, How are these things related? Well, rejoicing is is the expression of joy. That's what it means. To express joy, we rejoice. And joy and peace are actually frequently connected in the Bible. So, for example, Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then as we've um, kind of prayed many times this year, Paul says in Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Joy and peace leads to hope. And joy and peace are also clearly connected to prayer. This is a call to live a lifestyle of constant worship and prayer. Pray without ceasing. Constantly dependent upon God in all of the things that leads to an attitude of peace and joy. Constantly dependent upon God. That's what thanksgiving is. He says pretty much the same thing in Philippians chapter 4. In fact, listen to verses 4 to 7. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
This is God's will for the church. Constant rejoicing, constant joy, a constant prayer that leads to a constant thankfulness. And while this is a message for individual Christians, in fact, it has to be, right? We must each do these things. It's also a message for the assembled church, the gathered saints. When we gather each Lord's Day, we are called to rejoice. We are called to pray. We are called to to offer up thanksgiving constantly. Keep doing these things, he is saying. Constantly. This is the will of God for all who are in Christ Jesus. And it is this Christ who is our anchor. Our anchor. The church and her anchor. Verses 19 to 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Again, we are talking here about gathered worship. And it is helpful to see all of these statements as actually connected to one another. And as, if we could put it this way, because these are really hard to understand and often used inappropriately. Um, There are a couple of different ideas here. One is negative and one is positive. And Paul moves from general to specific. So there's negative and positive, and Paul moves from general to specific. So here's what I mean. Negatively, verses 19 and 20 are prohibitive. Do not, do not, right? Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise the prophecies. But verses 21 and 22 are positive commands. Instead, do this and this and this. But test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Within the negative commands, 19 and 20, we see a general command, verse 19, followed by a more specific command in verse 20. So one way, or maybe even the primary way, um, generally quenching the Spirit, one way that a person quenches the Spirit is by despising the prophecies, he's saying. These two verses... We make this really hard to understand sometimes. Um, I think we make these things more difficult than they really are. So let me explain this as simply as I can. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, always works in conjunction with the Word of God and never in opposition. The Holy Spirit always works in conjunction with the Word of God and never in opposition. So think of it like this. The Holy Spirit always does the will of the Father. That's a true statement. He cannot go against the will of God because he is God. And the will of God is the word of God. The word of God is the will of God. It is what God has spoken to us. Now a prophecy, a prophecy is just simply this. Thus saith the Lord. That's what a prophecy is. And because because we have the completed canon of Scripture, because we have all of God's Word, everything that God wanted to tell us is in His Word, because we have the completed canon of Scripture, the prophecies of old are no longer necessary. Instead, prophecy today is, is actually preaching. Prophecy today is saying, thus saith the Lord, right here. That's what prophecy is today. It's the faithful exposition of the Word of God. So this is saying, don't despise, don't disregard the proclamation of the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord. To do so is to say to the Holy Spirit, we don't need you. We don't need you working in our lives. We certainly don't need that musty old book. And we don't need these difficult to understand words. Usually the people who call us not to quench the spirit, who use that kind of language, are people who are more, in, more enamored with emotionalism and a, a charismatic pacer of the stage. 
than they care about listening to the careful exposition and proclamation of the Word of God. But the Spirit of God, I'm going to make this claim right now, the Spirit of God is working even here at RBC. The Spirit of God is working even here at RBC. It's working through the proclamation of the Word of God. And so sometimes people will say, because I prepare my sermons ahead of time, I don't just get up and wing it. Aren't you listening to the Spirit? Yeah, typically on Thursdays especially. (laughs) As I'm sitting in there and studying God's Word. The Spirit of God is working here at RBC, even though long-winded preaching uh, is a real thing. It's working even... I'm going to say it this way, even through the singing of biblically faithful old hymns. And so we are called to test everything, to be like the Bereans who searched the scriptures to see if what they were being taught is true. We are told to hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to the good news. Hold fast to the good teaching about the good book. Hold fast to the good spiritual fruit and stay far away from all forms of evil. This is what we are called to do here. So we must hold fast to Christ because it is He who is our sure and steady anchor. Not our emotionalism, not our thoughts or our feelings. It is Christ who has given us his word, God. Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to us by the prophets, Hebrews says. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. He has given us a good word in the scriptures and we must hold fast to it, remembering that Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. So hold fast to Him. Pray with me. Father, there are many, um, so many commands here and so many different avenues of looking at these verses. I pray that this would cause us to dig into Your Word, that we individually, as families, would search out these things and understand what it means as a, as a family, as a people of God, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances, knowing that these things are the will of God for us. Father, that we would understand what it means to admonish the idle and encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak patiently, to seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Father, that we would understand what it means to respect and esteem the elders, to not quench the Spirit, to not despise, thus saith the Lord, but to test everything, to search the Scriptures, to hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil, no matter what it is, no matter what our society or our heart, the world, the flesh, and the devil put upon us, Lord. That we might be the people of God, transformed into Christ's likeness. And so we pray now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.